Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our service here at the Tron this evening. We're going to begin by singing. You'll find it in these blue books at number 291, a great hymn of praise and of hope and of confidence in our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ triumphant, ever reigning Savior, Master, King. Well, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, 
not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Lord, we thank you that as you exhort us through the apostle, so we can draw near to you gladly with clean hearts, with full assurance of faith because of our priestly king enthroned forever high in heaven above. And so our hymns of love will never be stifled and our access to you will never be cut off. That's why we can raise our voices so joyfully to sing tonight. That's why we gather here together to be reminded of these things, to have it impressed afresh upon our heart that we have a hope that is sure, that is certain because of the truth of your glorious gospel. All that you have promised has come to fruition and fulfillment in the person of our Savior. And so... We can walk by faith, not yet by sight, but by faith in your sure and certain word. And we need to know that, Lord. We need to know it again and again and again. We face so many pressures from without, so much that would face us and oppose us in this world that is so opposed to you. We face so much that would drag us down from within, from within our own hearts and our prone propensity to waywardness, to sinfulness, to faithlessness. But we have a hope that is sure and certain. And as we gather tonight, Lord, we ask that once again, as already through our gatherings today, you have touched our hearts and encouraged us and turned our eyes again to you. Do that again tonight, we pray that in this coming week we might live as people of faith, confident, courageous, joyful, steady, not rocked from side to side, but following our Lord Jesus Christ, living for him, speaking for him day after day. Lord, you know our hearts. You know that on our own we can do nothing. But how we thank you that we're not on our own, that you're with us. And therefore, although the earth could crumble around us, nothing can make our footing any less sure because we know that you're with us. So hear us, Lord. Fill our hearts afresh with assurances of your presence and of your power. And send us into the world to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his precious name. Amen. Welcome, particularly to anybody who's visiting with us uh, this evening. We hope you feel at home with us. Don't rush away afterwards. There's uh, tea and coffee and uh, refreshments and so on served upstairs here. Also down in the, in the foyer areas. And uh, it's an opportunity for us to encourage one another in the Lord after the formal part of the evening is, uh, is complete. Uh, if you're with us this morning, you'll have received one of these notice sheets. If not, uh, and you haven't got one, they're, they're on the trolleys outside. Do pick one up. They tell you all the things that you need to know about the life of the church this coming week. Uh, there are lots of ministries going on through the week. Uh, we're keen for folk to know about them. Very especially, let me remind you, Wednesday evening is our fortnightly prayer meeting when we gather from uh, all the congregations uh, to pray for the work of Christ here, but uh, even more importantly, with our many uh, mission partners around the world. I hope we'll have Scott Murray, uh, one of our missionaries who serves in Thailand. I hope he'll be with us on Wednesday. He's with us just briefly for 10 days. He comes every year at this time to, uh, to lecture in tropical medicine at the university here, uh, and uh, he's with us. He's not here tonight. He's gone off up to Aberdeen to visit Cara, his daughter, who's down with a flu. But uh, all being well, he'll be back with us on Wednesday. And uh, it's always a great inspiration uh, to hear from Scott's latest exploits. So, so don't miss that uh, on Wednesday and the opportunity to pray together. Uh, and then just finally, uh, there is 
Uh, another meeting of the Christian Institute tomorrow evening, uh, Monday, uh, at Greenview Church. We hosted one here a couple of weeks ago. It was that night of all the snow, and lots of people weren't able to be here. Uh, so if you missed that, you want to go tomorrow evening, 8 o'clock at Greenview. And uh, it was a very helpful, uh, a very informative uh, evening indeed. Uh, so if you missed it and you'd like to go, uh, you can go tomorrow evening, Greenview Church, uh, at 8 o'clock, uh, 8 p.m. Well, uh, we're delighted this, uh, this weekend to have uh, some visitors from Slovakia. We've got the Tolnai family back with us, and uh, Chab and Darina are here, and uh, Richard, who is uh, unrecognizable to me, having grown to three times the size since they were uh, with us here. But it's quite a little while since, uh, welcome Chab, it's quite a little while since you came to be with us here. And I just remind us when you, when you first came to, to be with us here at the Tron. Ooh. Hold this in your mouth. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that we are very, very happy that we can be here among you for a long time, after, after a long time. I remember very clearly uh, when I stood here very first time, it was the 28th of June 2008, so nearly 10 years ago. Goodness me. Yes, and I realize now more than, than 10 years ago that uh, really without you, we couldn't be here such a long time, the two years. So we are very grateful for that. Yes, we, we came to Glasgow uh, in August 2008, and I started because uh, I didn't know any words in, in English. Uh, I started learn English uh, language first year, and second year I did I studied in Cornhill uh, Bible uh, Bible course, and it was very amazing time, and Glasgow became the uh, second home for us for all our family. He's absolutely right. He spoke, I think, six other languages when he came here, but not English. <laughs> And it only took him one year to learn enough English to study at Cornhill. That's quite impressive, isn't it? Some folk here have been trying to learn English all their life, and they're still not as good as you are. <laughs> so you came, and you had, a, you had that year with us, and then you had your year at Cornhill. And I can't believe it was as long ago as that. Goodness me, time flies, doesn't it? But then since then, you went back to Slovakia, and you've been working in a church in Levice. Levice. It, um, yes, Levice it is, is my hometown, and I still work in Levice at the church. I am leader of a Christian cafe called Contact Cafe. It is a youth center, and we, we do their evangelistic sessions, and we help to many young people <coughs> to leave because most of them are coming from dysfunctional families and they need to Jesus. And I recognize that I'm a soldier on the front line mm. among the people. Mm -hmm. So that's why I became be a, a leader. And also I, sometimes I preach at the church also. And we had some folk from here came out one summer, didn't we, and, and did a, a summer mission team with you? Yes, it was uh, 2011. Uh, Terry McCutcheon and John Taylor, was, they were leaders, and 10 young people from Scotland they came to Slovakia and we, we did many such fantastic uh, evangelistic activities um, around, around to Slovakia. And I think after, it was after that, wasn't it, that that Kenny McLeod came to, to stay Yes, with you. Kenny McLeod. He came to Slovakia to visit us in 2011, and he said he's going to try to live in Slovakia, in Levice. And he stayed. So now, it's a six year, he lives in Levice, he's doing well. But, uh, and uh, he's, a, he's a teacher in, in a language school and always cycling. And every Sunday, we, we meet each other at the church. You need to tell him to get in touch with us. He's a naughty boy. He hasn't been in touch for a long time. So <laughs> yeah. tell him, tell him yeah, he's, yeah, in the, yeah. he's in the doghouse. I, do I will, I will. 
Well, that's great. So, so tell us a little bit. We, we, we know a little bit about the work, but what are the, what are the particular challenges that you have there at, at the Chaba in, in um, reaching out to, to the young people that you're, you're dealing with? And what, what can we particularly pray for your work there in Levitsa? Uh, well, I think most of them are very wounded. Mm -hmm. uh, because most of them coming from dysfunctional families. They need love, they need father and mother. And this is sometimes it's quite hard work, but we need the love and accept him. And, and so for a strengthening and for a power from heaven. Mm -hmm. And the church grouping that you belong to. Yeah. Um, uh, it's been great for us to have several others come from Slovakia to, to Cornhill, at Cornhill, and we have we have Philip here uh, this year. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about the, how things are going in the in the denomination. Are there are there other people coming through in training? Are there new churches being being planted? Yes, we yeah we have a special program in the planting, so we have a uh, we, are, we are working on on planting on third congregation. Uh, Congregation, congregation yeah. in Bratislava, capital city, and uh, also in Levice, in our town, we started uh, do a evening services for f in a different uh, place, on a different place, for people who who never heard about Jesus, mm -hmm. and we do it uh, almost five months, and approximately 50, 60 people are coming uh, on Sunday evening. So it is going to be s s slowly the, another yeah. church or another congregation. And do you find, are, are people open to hear about the gospel or are they increasingly like the rest of the West, not interested? Uh, well, as true is that the secularism it's very strong in also in our country. And yeah, Bel the fate of Jesus is doing down in, in our society. Uh -huh. Yes. But on the other side, many people they recognize that it must be must something must happen in their life because they lost mm -hmm. suicide or alcoholism and drugs and then they recognize if we help them they recognize that Jesus is only way and only answer but uh, globally is, is a secularism this is very strong in our country mm -hmm. also so you're up against many of the same things that we are here really mm -hmm. it's the task mm -hmm. the same everywhere it's lovely to see you. Let's, let's pray for uh, Chava and Darina just while they're, while they're here. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, our brother here. We thank you for all the work that uh, this represents in, in Slovakia and Levitsa and, and uh, in, in the wider network of churches. And we, we thank you for, for that relationship that we've had going back these 10 years, indeed more, with uh, brothers there. Thank you for those who've come across here and been able to be at Cornhill. Thank you for Philip here this, this year studying. And we pray for the ongoing work there in Levit. So we, we thank you for the opportunities that Chaba has with, with these young folks, some of them very troubled, uh, hurting from, from difficult backgrounds. And we thank you for the, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ that they're able to share with them. Thank you for this new evening congregation that's begun and is growing. And we pray for every opportunity there uh, to share the gospel of Jesus, that you would bless it abundantly. We thank you also for our brother Kenny and for the way that he's found a home there uh, now for all these years and his teaching and serving in the church there. We thank you for the way that that uh, summer visit and that fellowship with Chaba here just led to him being taken by you to go and serve you in that place. And we rejoice in that. We pray for him and his ongoing ministry also. We thank you, Lord, for uh, just renewing fellowship this weekend with Chaba and Darina and Richard. And we praise you for these bonds in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that their time here will be one of great encouragement and blessing as they see many friends 
and as they're reminded of the fellowship that we have in the gospel. And so we pray for them all now and ask that you'd go with them back to Slovakia and bless and enrich their work there because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, that's lovely. Do take a chance to, uh, to chat with Chava uh, and Darina uh, afterwards. Well, we're going to sing again on the screens. And it's a hymn that reminds us that the hand of God is at work all through the world all the time, which we see by faith. Well, if you take up your Bibles, we're going to read together once again in the prophet Habakkuk. If you have one of our uh, church visitors Bibles, uh, I think that's page 787. If not, it is very near the end of the Old Testament, after Nahum and uh, before Zephaniah. Just hiding away there on a couple of pages. And we're going to read together chapter 3. 
We we're looking at this last week when Phil was uh, uh, preaching on it. We we're looking particularly at the last verses of the chapter, but we'll read from the beginning this whole prayer, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth, uh, some sort of musical term. It tells us it's a song. We we're thinking this morning, weren't we, of substantial gospel song. And here is one of them. O Lord, he says, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. And then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sunk low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging water swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed you crush the head of the house of the wicked, laying them bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, the flocks be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. Amen. May God bless to us his word. Well, the Bible is indeed full of songs, not least the words of the Psalms. And we're going to sing one of those now, a psalm that speaks of the same faith and trust and hope in God, even in the face of many dangers and enemies, as Habakkuk speaks about here. It's number 91, a version of uh, Psalm 91, and uh, the second one in our hymn book, 91 Be safe in the shadow of the Lord, beneath his hand and power. I trust in him, my fortress and my tower. Number 91 B. <laughs>
Well, our offerings for the Lord's work will now be received. And uh, as the musicians play quietly, you might like to just be quietly in prayer. Or maybe to read again this song of Habakkuk's that we'll be studying in just a few moments. As we do that, our offerings are received. We're going to sing together the words of the prayer on the screens. Now, in reverence and awe, we gather round your word. In wonder, we draw near to the word of God.
Well, good evening, and please do turn in your Bibles back to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3. And you'll find that on page 787 of the church Bibles if you've lost your place. Habakkuk, chapter 3. And we look at the second section of this chapter, which is really all about the prayer that the righteous pray. But before we come to listen to that prayer, let's pray a prayer of our own. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in a world that is full of lies and spin, we thank you for the chance this evening to gather together in your name to hear your word of truth. Remember Paul's words in Romans 15 when he says that everything written in the Old Testament was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And Father, we thank you that this includes the book of Habakkuk. And so, Lord, this evening, would you encourage us and give us the hope to persevere by faith as we live as exiles in this foreign land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Habakkuk is singing. He's singing a beautiful prayer of submission and praise to the Lord in response to what the Lord has shown him. You'll remember, those of you who've been here over the past three weeks, that the Lord told Habakkuk of two waves of coming judgment. The first wave will sweep over Judah, the people of God, his Old Testament church, in the form of the Babylonian army. Back in chapter 1, the Lord assured Habakkuk that he'd seen all of the rebellion that was taking place amongst his people. And as a consequence, he was sovereignly raising up a war machine, the Chaldean killers, this evil superpower nation that was going to come and be his instrument of judgment and discipline over his people. They're headed straight for Judah. And not even the righteous remnant of faith, the group of true believers within the land, not even they will escape this invasion. The true people of God will also be swept up in the Lord's discipline. But the Lord also assures Habakkuk of a second, much larger coming wave of judgment. And it will come at the Lord's appointed time in history when according to chapter 2, verse 14, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And on that day, all those who have proudly set themselves against the Lord, against his word, and against his people, they will get their comeuppance. They will face retribution for what they've done. On that day, Babylon and all those who've lived by the same heart attitude as Babylon, they will face punishment from the Lord for the atrocities that they've committed. God will bring justice and vindicate his people in the end. In other words, Habakkuk has heard that God is going to judge everyone. God's going to judge everyone. Judgment will begin with a household of faith, and then the rest of the world will follow. And the only hope for everyone is found in chapter 2, verse 4, where the Lord promises that the righteous, in chapter 2, verse 4, the righteous shall live by faith. That is, only those who turn away from living a life of sinful, self-sufficient pride to humbly bow the knee to the Lord, to look to Him for life and to build their lives upon His commandments. Only those who do that will be delivered and kept and delivered in the end. And that's why that's such a crucial verse in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. But it's also such an important book in the rest of the Bible. For the book of Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews all quote Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 and apply its message to us, those of us living at this present age. The only hope for us today in the face of the wrath of God that is being revealed from heaven now and which will come in all its fullness on the last day is for us to have faith in God's gospel promises. But what does that faith look like and what does it sound like? And of course the answer is Habakkuk chapter 3. Because as we listen to Habakkuk's prayer song, we hear the voice of genuine faith. Here, the the prophet, if you like, has been held up as a model example of what 2 verse 4 is like in the flesh. As often so the case with Old Testament prophets, so often the messenger becomes the message. The messenger becomes the message. They embody the message that they're sent to preach. And in this song, Habakkuk takes the faith that he professes 
And he works it out in his current circumstances of everyday life. And the people of God back then in ancient Judah and the people of God today, all of us here, we are invited to, as it were, sing along with the prophet in our hearts to follow his example, to live by the same faith in our current circumstances so that we will persevere and not fall away. And last week, in chapter 3, verse 1 to 15, we saw that Habakkuk actually spends most of his prayer song remembering the past and the ways in which the Lord appeared to save his people from the enemy. Let me just give you a quick recap of the three things that he specifically highlighted. Habakkuk remembered that the Lord showed terrifying power when he appeared. When he came in the past, the sky was engulfed in his splendor. Flashing rays of pure light fired out from the palms of his hands. The whole creation shook to its very core. Nations, nations that had opposed God's people, were petrified because of the power of the covenant God of Israel. Then Habakkuk also remembered that the Lord came with a ferocious arsenal, ferocious weapons at his disposal. No human power on earth can compare to the power of the Lord, our God, for when he appeared, he did so as the ultimate warrior with unrivaled weaponry, pestilence and plague, just two of his weapons of choice. And if you were to go through those verses later on, you'll see that the rivers, the seas, the earth, the deep, the lightning, the sun, the moon, all are described as things which the Lord has at his disposal and which in the past the Lord has used to wipe out the enemy and save his people and one in the same action. And on that note, Habakkuk remembers thirdly the ways in which the Lord has crushed the head of the house of the enemy time and again through history, giving Habakkuk hope that one day soon the Lord would do exactly the same to the king of Babylon. The Lord may even use the enemy's own weapons against them as he has done so frequently in the past. Now Habakkuk remembers these things in his prayer song in order to give himself a glimpse of what is to come. He looked back to look forward. And we must do the same today as the people of God. The mighty acts of the Lord uh, that have happened in the past should fill us with great fear, but also with great joy at what is to come in the future. We look back to look forward because God's former judgments in history give us a foretaste of his final judgment on history. Well, in our passage this week, having remembered the Lord who comes, Habakkuk finishes his prayer by declaring that he will resolutely place his trust in the Lord, no matter what happens, even if the whole land is ravaged and ruined by the enemy. And with the rest of our time this, afternoon, uh, this evening, I want us to notice two things, two marks of genuine faith that Habakkuk displays, which should hopefully challenge us and encourage us. The first thing is this, genuine faith trembles at the God who speaks. Genuine faith trembles at the God who speaks. Please look at verse 16. Habakkuk says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon those who invade us. So Habakkuk has heard the news of the coming invasion by the Babylonian war machine, the Lord's instrument of judgment. It's on its way. It's coming. And it will not be stopped. And that is what he's confessing here. He's confessing to the Lord that, Lord, I've heard what you said, and I believe you. I believe your word. And it has rocked me to the very core of my being. I wonder if you notice the, the, there's a fourfold repetition of things describing his inner anguish. He is totally shaken. Just listen again. My body trembles. My lips quiver. Rottenness has entered my bones. I'm, I'm paralyzed with fear. I'm overwhelmed. My legs tremble. He's honestly saying, Lord, I've heard your voice and I believe you. And as a result, I cannot stand. I'm so struck. I know that I'm utterly powerless in what is to come. And the only thing for me to do is to wait patiently with the knees knocking for you to deal with Babylon at your appointed time. Don't miss what this teaches about the nature of genuine faith. 
The turmoil and anguish that Habakkuk is going through is not a denial of his faith, but it is an evidence of his faith. He is all upset precisely because he believes the Lord and his word. His trembling is caused by his trust. Now, I reckon, if you're honest, that most people today wouldn't think about anguish and turmoil and faith in those sort of terms. I reckon most of us, if we were honest, we would say that someone who responds to the Lord's word like this, well, they're doing something wrong. It's a sign of doubt or unbelief. Well, not according to Habakkuk. The turmoil in his heart is there because of his faith. It's evidence he's a true believer. Yes, Habakkuk knows that there is a day of great deliverance coming when the mighty divine warrior described in 3 to 15 will come. But that future glorious salvation will only come after the church has gone through heavy suffering and oppression from the enemy. God has said that this will be the case and that's why Habakkuk is like a plate of jelly. Genuine faith will tremble at the God who speaks because sometimes what the Lord says will disturb us, will shake us. Listen to one commentator. He says this, if you're not convinced that this is a mark of true faith, then think about a later date in the Bible when the remnant of faithful Israel was reduced to a single individual, a similar circumstance developed alone in the garden, peering into the awesome abyss of hell, contemplating the spiritual exile that he was about to experience on the cross. The Lord Jesus himself sweated great drops of blood. Even though he was assured that the Father would not leave his soul in hell, yet the reality of the agonies that he had to endure before his deliverance, the exile he was about to go through, overwhelmed him. His soul was exceedingly troubled and his body responded with awesome signs of sympathy. Genuine faith trembles at the God who speaks. We can see that in Habakkuk. And we can see that in the Lord's ultimate prophet, the Lord Jesus himself. Can I just say, if you're here this evening, and if you find yourself trembling at some of the truth that God speaks, maybe it's the truth that to follow him, you must pick up your cross and go through an age of tribulation and trial. If you tremble at those sorts of words, then that's not a wrong response. That is genuine faith. We sometimes think that uh, faith will relieve the pressure and give us a peaceful, easy feeling in our minds. Well, Habakkuk says the opposite will happen. For genuine faith trembles at the God who speaks. That's the first thing. Secondly, notice genuine faith triumphs in the God who saves. Genuine faith triumphs in the Lord who saves. Please look at verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So the same word that causes Habakkuk to tremble is the same word that fills him with triumph. Despite the fact that he's trembling at the promise of coming invasion, He resolutely sets his trust on the Lord whose promises uh, that the righteous shall live by faith. The Lord has told Habakkuk that this is the case and so he stakes everything upon it. He says, I'm going to resolutely stake my whole life upon that promise. It is his knowledge of the Lord's faithfulness to his promises that's the source of great strength and, and joy. Do you notice that? He's trembling And yet at the same time, he's full of joy because he knows who he's dealing with here. The covenant God. Babylon could do whatever whatever they want to the land and whatever they want to Habakkuk, but he knows that it will not ultimately affect his standing before the covenant God. The entire present world order could pass away, but it would still not nullify God's gracious promises that he's made to his people. They will endure The Lord said the righteous shall live by faith and go on living. And so Habakkuk trusts in that. And that's what he's saying in verse 17. Even if the Babylonian brutes burst in in the land and seize it with their violent ways, even when they've ravaged our produce and our sustenance, even when our economy is trashed and we're living in poverty, 
even when our livestock has been mauled and we are sitting in complete darkness, even when we've seemed to be utterly abandoned by the Lord, I will rejoice. I will rejoice in the fact that I still belong to the God who keeps his promises. He's promised to deliver us. Might not look like it now. Just now it looks like he's abandoned us, but he will. That's what he said. And our God is not one for breaking his promises. And he will give me the strength that I need to stand firm in the present. He is the one who will help me. Look at verse 19. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deer's. He makes me tread on high places. Habakkuk is quoting here from Psalm 18, where King David praises the Lord for rescuing him from the hand of the enemy and from the hand of Saul. You probably know it. And David says back in that psalm, for who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my ways blameless. He made my feet like that of a deer, and set me secure on the heights. And I just say that if you're here this evening, and if you're not yet a Christian, if you're not trusting in the Lord, then please know that this is what he is like. He is not a God to be messed with. You do not mess with the God of the Bible. But he's also the God who is so good to his people. Even when they're feeling oppressed, he is so good beyond measure all, to all those who take him at his word. God's people here are described as being sure-footed, untiring, bounding with energy. The Lord's people may ex- expect to ascend to the heights of victory, even when they face severe setbacks. Habakkuk knows that that is what he received from the Lord, even though his current circumstances suggest the contrary. The Lord will keep him, and the, he will keep the rest of the remnant going through the invasion And he will deliver them in the end. But you know, I think what Habakkuk is speaking about here isn't just found uh, in the return from exile to Babylon. Listen to O. Palmer Robertson. He says this, Is it resurrection faith that comes to expression in these final words of the prophet? Is he speaking of an expectation of a life after the last enemy has done his worst? Certainly his faith is not far from that point. I think what Habakkuk is really speaking about is the same reality that the Apostle Paul would later write about in Romans chapter 8 when he says to the church of Jesus Christ, we, God's people, are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things in the present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Genuine faith trembles at the God who speaks, but it also triumphs in the God who saves, even in the face of horrific coming loss. Friends, if you're here this evening, then you are someone, and if you're a Christian, then you are someone who is in exile. You are strangers living in this world because your home is in the presence of the Lord. And as long as you're living in exile, then you're surrounded by enemies of the gospel. Yes, they're defeated enemies like sin, Satan, and death, but they remain powerful and active. And they may may well ravage the church in our day, just like the Babylonians did to Judah back then. And the challenge for us is, will we follow Habakkuk's example? Will we tremble knowing that the Lord has called us in his word to endure many hardships before entering the kingdom of God. And in this life, the church may well lose everything. You and I might well lose everything. And certainly if Britain carries on in the current trajectory that it's set on, get ready for a lot more opposition from the world around us. We might lose everything. That's what the word of God says to us. And we should tremble. But we should also triumph in the one who gives us the promise because he says to us, If you stand by me and trust in my promises, I will keep you. I will raise you one day in power when my son returns. And you will enjoy life in the new heavens and the new earth forever. Never again to suffer. Never again to face injustice. 
One of my good friends, you don't know him, he lives down south in England. And over the past, he's a Christian, and over the past couple of years, when I've looked at his life, I've pretty much seen all the things that fill me with terror, all the things that keep me awake at night. I have seen swamp upon this friend of mine. He has received a total kick in from the enemies of the gospel, especially the enemies of death. He's seen loved ones and his family drop away like flies well before their time. And now his own body is failing and he's dying and decaying. And yet, you know, every time I speak to this friend of mine, every time I catch up with him, he reminds me of Habakkuk because he does tremble at what he's going through and he knows it's part of the cross-shaped life. He trembles and he has anguish, but even in his tears, there's triumph. He's this weird mixture of both because he knows the Lord and he knows the Lord's promise that the righteous shall live by faith and he has staked everything upon that. And so that's why whilst he's full of trembling, he's also full of triumph in the Lord who saves. What about you? When the enemies of the gospel smash you in the face next, what will your song be? What about us as a church, as a church family? When we suffer, we've suffered together in the past. We will suffer again in the future. Will we echo the words of the prophet in our heart? Will we sing this song in our souls? If we do, if we trust in the Lord, we will not be disappointed. Let's be quiet for a moment to respond to the word of God in our own hearts, and then I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, we know that for as long as we live in this world, we, your people, are exiles living in a foreign land, and we are surrounded by the enemies of the gospel. The sinful nature that remains in, in us constantly seeks to make us wander away from you, the God we love. The world around us often opposes us for loving your word and living by it. The evil one is ever near us, seeking to devour us. Oh, Father, please have mercy on us and help us. By the power of your spirit, please give us the strength to resolutely set our faith and trust upon your promises and fill us with joy. Give us the desire to want to echo this song of Habakkuk in our weary and often downcast hearts so that we will not fall away, but instead we will wait for the glorious appearing of your son, the divine warrior who's already inaugurated your kingdom and who will one day come again to fully consummate it in power. Help us to look forward to that day when the earth will see you and all who've trusted in your promises will stand vindicated, raised in power, never again to suffer, but instead to glorify you forever in the new heavens and the new earth. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing in response to the Lord's word together. 901, 901. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end. 901.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.